we have noted on the other evenings that we would devote a little time to certain marginalia concerning General Pike and some of the points in connection with his life and research which we think may be of interest uh, to those of our students who are searching for better foundation work in early comparative religion. Well, when I was in Washington a number of years ago, it occurred to me that it was quite possible that Brady, the Civil War photographer, uh, who is famous for his photographs of Grant and Lincoln, and other outstanding persons of the period, might have done something pictorially in connection with General Pike. Uh, the House of the Temple did not have any records that such were the case, but I browsed around Washington and I found, found out that Brady had taken some pictures of General Pike, and I was able to secure one, which I think is not too bad, for it shows the general in one of his most natural and picturesque uh, postures, working with his oversized German pipe, which he uh, greatly favored. This is one of Brady's photographs of General Pike, taken probably in the early 80s, or when the general was, as he called it himself, in the prime of his advancing years, <laughs> which is a rather good term for it, I think. So I thought perhaps it would be nice to take, uh, show you this picture, and later why you can look at it more in detail if you wish to. We seem to be without any uh, place to put it, so we hope the general will not feel humiliated. I'm sure he would not. Now also in connection with this point, I'd like to uh, make a few remarks based upon an early uh, study of General Pike, which records a phase of him which I do not find in any of his official biographies. This is by um, illustrious brother Henry Ridgely Evans, Grand Tyler of the Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. He says, General Pike was deeply versed in the philosophy of Vedanta. Now, this is something that we uh, perhaps might not be quite so uh, well acquainted with, and as much, of course, as this was many years before the great uh, World Congress of Religions, which brought the Swami Vivekananda to this country. And up to that time, only a very few individuals, perhaps Emerson and a few others, were really aware of this particular philosophy. The author of this article continues, with all his studies in the mysticism of the Orient, he, he ever maintained his mental equipoise his fine analytic and discriminating power. All that he wrote was tempered with philosophic insight. He fully appreciated the spiritual profundities of the Vedas and the Zendavesta, and sought to link the Orient with the Occident. He was indeed an emperor of the East and West, which incidentally is a Masonic term, whose true symbol was the double-headed eagle. Uh, this point that he was acquainted with and familiar with a subject such as Vedanta uh, sort of moves him again into a slightly different category when we are studying the things that he did. A little human episode I think is indicative of Pike's position. Uh, we know that he lived in one of the most uh, turbulent periods in American history and that he was in the middle of it. That practically all of his life until he finally retired to Washington DC was in the field as a pioneer in law and letters, in poetry and in military strategy, and many, many other things. But in the year 1886, John Hallam was at that time writing his biographical and pictorial history of Arkansas. Um, yeah, incidentally, Pike had been one of the first citizens of Arkansas begged General Pike to give him some facts concerning his varied and picturesque career. Pike complied with the request, remarking, I have often refused to write an autobiographical sketch for publication, not through delicacy or modesty, but because I could truly say with the needy knife grinder, story, God bless you, 
I have none to tell, sir. None I know that would be worth anyone's reading. I am perfectly conscious that I have no aptitude for that type of authorship, and that if I were to undertake it, the result would be stale, flat, and unprofitable. And General Pike, to the end of his life, insisted that nothing interesting had ever happened to him. <laughs> this is another uh, sidelight on a very interesting man, but shows uh, some of the peculiarities uh, that we often find with that type of person. I'll probably have all these things spread out just the way I want them. <laughs> now, uh, I want to uh, point out one uh, situation that Pike faced early in his studies of comparative religion because I think it has a direct bearing on us work this evening. Uh, while he was still practicing law in Arkansas and recovering from the numerous trials and tribulations of the Civil War, he was working on his manuscripts and one of the most interesting of these is the Indo-Aryan Deities and Worship, in which he attempts the study of the Rig Veda. In introducing this subject, Pike goes over most of the available authorities of his time and points out that there is a serious difficulty which no one seems to have been able to um, solve. And that is that we not only have to find out what the original author meant but when we find out and we make even a most accurate and careful translation, we are still in no position to know that we have transmitted his idea. This is a, a very difficult situation because we have to use words that were unknown to him. We have to take concepts for which he had particular terms and we have to, we have to try to find uh, some way of expressing things familiar to him in words that he never heard of. Now, it's not only that we might be wrong, but he cannot uh, use censorship over the fact that his own language has changed, that even the most careful scholarship runs against a number of very difficult situations as I attempted to point out in one of the earlier talks building up to this particular point. And in order to explain his own position, General Pike gives us some interesting words and terms which we all use every day and then asks us what they mean. And so in this particular uh, context, I think it might be interesting to follow some of his researches in words just for maybe five minutes to see how he approached a problem which most scholars have never yet been able to solve in a manner sac uh, satisfactory to others, even if satisfactory to themselves. As a very good scholar in Latin and Greek, uh, Pike chose a good many of his uh, terms for consideration at this moment uh, from these languages because of their gradual descent into our popular tongue. He starts here by using or giving us the word sacrament. Now that is a term which we think we know what it means. But let us see, according to uh, Pike, what the original word meant. Now supposing we found in a text the, uh, the Latin term sacramentum, just exactly what do we mean? Do we mean that this individual uh, took some holy and sacred obligation or something of that kind? Literally not. That is not the meaning of the word. Uh, the word means a deposit or a pledge made by a party in a legal suit in Rome. In other words, it begins as a legal term. Afterwards, it meant a military oath, usually an obligation to Caesar or the state. And after that, it meant any kind of an oath on any subject, and finally moved into our uh, usage, which actually does not mean an oath at all. We do not have the same meaning whatsoever. Now a word that we all use a great deal, Pike gives a little study to, and that is the word pagans. We now think of pagans as people whose faith 
is different from ours or who do not believe in one of the three religions to which we do not apply the term pagan, namely Christianity, Muslimism, and Judaism. All other religions we consider as pagan. Pike tells us, for example, that the Pagani were originally those people who lived in small villages and towns. That's what it means. Just a small town, folks. And that the uh, uh, that as Christianity in its development uh, gathered to itself more and more of those living in metropolitan areas or in the larger communities, uh, those were no, who were not converted were the ones in the small towns and in the distant places and in the villages and on the farms and things of that nature where the doctrine had actually not reached. Therefore, they, those who had not yet heard about it and therefore did not believe in it were the village dwellers or the pagans. And that's all the term means, actually. It has nothing to do with whether you're a good man or a bad man or a true believer or a false believer. It simply means that you lived out on a farm or in some small town where you did not enjoy the advantages of being able to listen to the sermons of the various preachers. That's approximately all the word means. But it certainly does not mean that anymore. And if the word pagan has come into ill repute, Pike points out the poor word heathen is in still worse trouble. Now, uh, what is a heathen? A heathen is supposed to be a false uh, person in false religious conviction. Therefore, it may be interesting to know that the word heathen originally uh, meant one of the wild tribe of Germans who lived on the heaths. In other words, it was a heath dweller, a person who lived uh, out in these great lands, and of course, something like the pagans or the small town people were a little outside of the odor of sanctity. They hadn't, it hadn't got there yet. So when we uh, when we say to a man today, "I think you're a heathen," I wonder if we really mean we think he lives on a wild heath, and that also he is of Teutonic extraction. We probably do not. But when these words are used, uh, we have trouble with them. And we also have trouble wherever popular idiom gradually changes the meaning of things. A few more of his uh, thoughts here would also perhaps be pleasant. The word passion originally simply meant suffering. So when an individual is described as passionate, it means he is suffering severely. Now that, that may not be perhaps quite the meaning we have now, but that's what it originally means. Now Pike, perhaps by uh, the law of association as advanced by Dr. Seabury, also came to the conclusion that he should put the word libertine along with the passionate man. Perhaps this is just a, an idea. But what does the word libertine mean? We have an idea that it means an individual of loose morals. Maybe you'll be surprised to read or uh, find that the original meaning is a free thinker. A libertine is an individual who dared to think his own thoughts. A liberal. But hardly is that the meaning with which we associate the word today. The word plague, meaning now an epidemical disease or some malady of that kind, merely means to be struck a blow. Well, of course, actually, I suppose if you get the plague, it is a bit of a blow. But uh, anyway, it, uh, it means to strike a blow. And our word pain does not mean suffering at all. It means punishment. Well, perhaps it's true that many times our pain is a form of punishment. Perhaps the older man was wiser than we are. But when an individual says he is in pain, it means he is under punishment. But again, we have lost the meaning of that. I like the original meaning of the word obsolete. Uh, we think of it, for instance, as meaning something that is far behind, out of style, no longer used, and so on. It means, actually, that a thing has lost its odor. A bouquet of flowers which no longer have any scent might be said to be obsolete because it has to lose its savor, its smell, or its scent in order to be obsolete. Well, I don't know, but uh, that's a rather a stretch from our present um, meaning. 
We also have the word derivative, which we incline to uh, term, uh, to relate to the term derive, or to come from. It actually means to take water out of the river. Now, you can imagine what you'd have to do when you start reading sacred books, trying to figure out the difference between popular meaning and real meaning, or between original meaning and surviving meaning. It could be very difficult. Attached means to put your finger out and touch something. It doesn't mean to take hold of it or to be fastened to it. It merely means to touch it. That, again, would be a form of attachment that would be rather gentle for our present thinking. We have the word firmamentum, uh, which we now tie with the concept of firmament or heaven. Originally, firmament was a foundation for a fort. It arises from our term fortis, which means to fortify or to make strong, and strength, prop, to hold up. Well, it now means the sky which you would, would scarcely be entirely in the original thinking. When we endorse a man's character, it means simply uh, that we do something on his back. From endorso, on the back. So we can endorse a check on the back. That is quite correct. But when we endorse a man's character, it means we would have to sign an affidavit on his back or something of that kind to make our meaning actually true. Our word disposition actually means to put in order. And how many people's dispositions are worthy of that claim? And finally, Pike gives us the term provisions, now meaning food, from provisio, which simply means foresight. Therefore, foresight, uh, perhaps associated with the animal storing up its food for the winter, is the origin of our word provision. It does not mean actually food stuff now, but we think of putting away food stuff as foresight against hunger. Now, these are examples that he gives uh, to show what happens when you start trying to put languages together or take them apart, for that matter, and that it's much easier sometimes to take them apart than it is to put them together. And he also points out that it is much easier to differ from the authorities than it is to correct them. And that difference is easy, but to come up with something that is really solutional is not quite so easy. So this is another little insight, not only into his thinking, but perhaps into relatively important thinking for all of us in connection with the exactness of terms. Now, in his researches into the Persian religion, Pike takes an attitude which perhaps is uh, rather important to us. It might, um, it might mean that before we get through with it, we'll spend a good deal of the evening on his attitude, but I think it is one that is essentially valuable. And strangely enough, he does not uh, uh, make this uh, basic concept from a quotation from the Avesta, or one of the sacred books of the Persians, but from the Phaedo of Plato. He quotes Socrates, where Socrates says, of the, uh, the great uh, initiatory institutions of the ancients, it well appears that those who established the mysteries, or secret assemblies of the initiates, were no contemptible personages but men of great genius, who in the early ages strove to teach us, under enigmas, that he who shall go to the invisible region without being purified will be precipitated into the abyss, while he who arrives there, purged of the stains of this world and accomplished in virtue, will be admitted to the dwelling place of the deity. The initiated are certain to attain to the company of the gods. This is from Socrates. Now this is basically uh, the premise upon which a very large part of his Avestan researches are based. First of all, then, let us try to restore his thinking. According to Pike, 
uh, the researches in the early and basic religions of the Persians uh, have led him to certain conclusions. One is that what we call the stream of the ancient Persian wisdom is one of the earliest streams of religious knowledge in the world. That it probably goes back far enough so that Pike says in the opening of his lectures on the areas, referring to the Rig Veda, he says the second oldest book in the world. Uh, he does not at that point name the oldest, but from the general consensus of his thinking, he does not believe necessarily that the Avestas are the oldest, but he believes that the stream of tradition uh, which later became embodied in the Avestic literature is one, if not the earliest, certainly the earliest that we can identify of the great uh, wisdom religious systems of the world. Now, uh, Pike apparently had some reservations concerning the interpretation of the Persian sacred writings by the Persians themselves. He seems to have taken the ground that the ancient Persian writings are not much more available 